So let's get started. Is Melissa on? Good afternoon, I am. Hi. Hey, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, this is awesome. It Great is opportunity. Awesome. Yeah. It is, yeah, it is awesome. So um, I wanna jump right into our interview with you because I, I just find your office to be really fascinating and what a powerful office. And we're celebrating Women's History Month. Um, we could go on for the rest of the year, quite frankly, because <laughs> there are a lot of women that we could honor. So um, I know that you're the city treasurer and, and we're gonna talk a bit about that. But before we go into that, I know you didn't just sprout up like a daffodil in the spring. <laughs> that you have um, done a lot of things over the course of your life. And so, I, you know, you have a varied life experience. You know, I know you're a wife, you're a mother, you're a sister, you're a daughter, yes. you're a community worker, and so much, much more. So can you just give us a snippet of where you've been in your life? Yes. Um, it's interesting because where I've been in my life, I never thought that I would be here today. Um, so I am a Chicagoan born and raised. I was born in Inglewood, actually, on the south side of Chicago. And I was raised by a single mother of three girls. And my mother was actually a union steward she worked in a factory and my mother would take, because childcare was an issue, my mother would take her three girls to union meetings and we would be running around the union hall at a very, very young age. And I think about the other little kids that ran around with us at, at that time, we're still friends today. It's amazing to me, the really tight knit family that we had back then, because the mothers would join together and kind of watch each other's kids while they were taking care of the union business. And um, my mother, when I was born in Inglewood, my mother was renting a home from a family member. And then my mother, um, and God, God bless her, as a single mother, I was so proud of her that she went off to purchase her first home. And so we moved then from Inglewood to the Austin community. And at the time when we moved to the Austin community, I, I, I laugh when I tell people like, we felt we had arrived <laughs> as a black family. And um, it, it was very diverse when we moved over to the Austin community. I will walk to Amundsen Park and I will walk to Joseph Lovett Elementary School, which is where I graduated from elementary. And I am a product of Chicago Public School as well. And I would go over to the Brickyard and um, we didn't do much shopping, but hung out. That was kind of like our hangout spot as, as teenagers. And I was just all in the Austin community. Well, I was the first in my family to attend college. And because my mother was a single mother, um, I was not able to go necessarily to one of those um, um, top ranked schools that people, you know, really look to go to. My mother was like, look, um, this is where these dollars are going to take to go where it is affordable. But I tell you, I had the best college experience. I went to Eastern Illinois University. And when I attended Eastern, I told myself, I am going to go to school, make a lot of money when I graduate. And so I knew that I wanted to go into business. I started in accounting. And I tell you, when I got to cost accounting, I said, okay, I don't think this is what my interest is. <laughs> The financial accounting, I love. When I got to the cost accounting, I said, later for this. And so I switched majors. And because I liked the financial aspect of it, I moved to finance. 
And I'll tell you, when I went to Eastern Illinois University, it is the smallest state university. So it had a very private feel and it was 5% black students at the time. When I was in the College of Business, I do not recall seeing any other black student in the College of Business at the time I attended Eastern Illinois University. So that was a um, very different experience for me, um, a very great experience that I really learned a lot from and learned how to interact with so many um, other communities, interact with people from all different walks of life. So I enjoyed my time at Eastern. And when I graduated, I went on to, oh, we got another EIU alum. An EIU alum, they're everywhere, by the way. And we have a very, very tight-knit alumni association. When I left Eastern Illinois University, graduated with my Bachelor of Science in Finance, I went on to um, actually work at First Chicago Bank at the time, which is now Chase. Mm -hmm. And I, I quickly found that mm, while that was great, I really wanted to go to a more corporate side of things and better pay. So I left First Chicago at the time and went on to work at Allstate Insurance, where I spent, and certainly I know your background, Madam Clerk, in insurance. It is. Um, yes. And I was um, with the claim side, the corporate side of things where it was a very great experience. I tell people a black woman working for a fortune 500 company, they were very good to me. However, I had an experience. Oh, and let me back up. While I was at Allstate, now we're talking about tuition reimbursement. So I was able for the first time to attend a private university because my employer paid for it. And I tell people all the time when I talk to young people, that was a great opportunity. And I have loans, we talk, we talk about student loan forgiveness. I have loans from my undergrad, but when I was in grad, I was able to have my tuition reimbursed through my employer. So I attended Roosevelt University in Chicago and received my MBA in finance while working at Allstate. Well, we had an, a program at Allstate where they will loan their executives to a not-for-profit organization. By the way, I think this is an absolutely great program. They will loan their um, executives to a not-for-profit organization. And so it would be like a three to six month stint. Well, during that time, I volunteered to go to Breakthrough Urban Ministries, which is in Garfield Park. Breakthrough Urban Ministries is, is an organization, not-for-profit that helps and support the homeless population. And that was extremely eye-opening for me. So what's great for the not for profits is that you get an executive who comes in, helps you in whatever way that you need. You have me for six months and you don't have to pay for me. All state is paying for me. So of course, not for profits love this. Well, it was that experience that was really eye-opening. And I made one of the most important and one of the best decisions I could have made. And that was to leave corporate America and work for my community. And that's when I ran for state representative. I loved it. Same as you, I know, Madam Clerk, you were in Springfield longer than I was, know the ins and outs. And um, I, I think a lot about legislation in Springfield and for residents to really be educated. Oh, another, okay. And Robin is from Roosevelt. See, I'm telling you, EIU and Roosevelt everywhere. Um, and I think about legislation that affects our lives that are happening in Springfield that residents really are not necessarily engaged with in tune with. I really made it my business to educate residents on the importance of being engaged. And so there are some legislation in Springfield that I was most proud of. It'll just be two that I mentioned, because as you know, there's so many bills and things of that that we work on. But two in particular that I was most proud of, one, as a mother of a young girl. When I went to Springfield, by the way, I was a nursing mother. My daughter was just born. And as you know, in Springfield, not necessarily conducive to that of a woman. 
and especially a mother. You go nonstop in Springfield and I'm trying to find time to nurse my baby and do this and that and they don't necessarily allow the time. So trying to make these things happen and make certain I don't miss votes, but also make certain that I'm taking care of my daughter and feeding her. So a lot was going on at the time, but two pieces of legislation that was very, very near and dear to me. Number one was child care assistance restoration. When Bruce Warner came into office, he cut child care assistance that nearly 15,000 families lost child care. And we know as parents how important it is to have quality child care and not have to go to work and worry about your child and the care. And so I was able to provide this legislation where I was the chief sponsor, the initiator of the, initiator of the legislation, where we were able to restore that funding. And those almost 15,000 families were able to be restored back to the program. That was a huge, huge deal. And by the way, let me add this. I told somebody, I said, I think I'm a bad woman. I said, because Bruce Runner cut the program. And by the time I got through with him, he signed the legislation put, to put it back. In <laughs> That's great. That's great. What a great story. <laughs> And then the second piece of legislation that was very near and dear to me, we know that um, inequity in education is, is really a huge factor. And I was able to um, really help to bring an additional $221 million back to the city of Chicago for the new education funding um, based system that we had. So I was very excited about that. And then the opportunity came up to run for city treasurer. And by the okay. way, let me just let me let ahead. me just jump in for because a minute. you know I can just talk. Yes, so you you jump can, in. and I and I want <laughs> you to. But um, uh, so though that kind of gives people a thumbnail sketch of where you've been in your life, and so now let's jump right into what yes. inspired you to seek the city treasurer's office. How about that? That's exactly where I was going. Thank you, madam. <laughs> so. What inspired me to run for city treasurer? So as I was state representative at the, at the time, traveling back and forth to Springfield, um, my daughter and I doing what we do, there was an opportunity where the treasurer's office, the, the person that was in this role was not seeking re-election. But let me share this with you. I'll give you all this tidbit that many of you may not even have realized. So the city of Chicago has three citywide elected officials that are technically elected. That's the mayor, that's the clerk, that's the treasurer. Well, for some reason, the treasurer was the only citywide elected role that was always appointed first by the mayor. And let me tell you why, how that happened. So what would happen is that if, let's say, um, if, if someone is in this role and they leave to go on for maybe run for another office, or if they lead to go to corporate America, which is a lot of people do from this role, and they go for a bigger, better job, let's say. Well, if, the, if this role becomes vacant, then the mayor has the authority to appoint. Well, it was just so happening in Chicago's history over 50 years that the mayor would appoint the treasurer and then at the time where the treasurer will now run, because you do have to go through an election, at that time, no one would run against that person because they're already the incumbent. Everyone knew that the mayor had the power, the mayor put them in, and they never had a contested race. Well, when Ron Emanuel decided that he was not going to seek re-election, the treasurer at the time decided the same thing. So four years ago in 2019, the city of Chicago had an opportunity to elect its own mayor and elect its own treasurer, obviously the clerk as well. And so I had a very contested race four years ago, unheard of in Chicago's history. But what led me to this seat is because I saw a state representative, the importance of representation, traveling back and forth to make sure that I'm acting on behalf of my community. But also in addition to that, I'm like, this is a no brainer. BS in finance, MBA in finance, my experience in finance, 
and yet my desire for public service. I'm like, this is a win-win. And so I ran for this office and great support throughout the city of Chicago. I went into a runoff election after the initial primary election and um, I was the lead in the primary and then I won the runoff election. And now four years later, here am I. And by the way, um, just won re-election. Well, this time, uncontested for treasure. Yay. <laughs> yeah, look, it seems like everybody wants to be mayor in Chicago. So I just went on <laughs> and there was no contest for this re-election, but certainly four years ago, we did a lot to get here. So let's get into the job and the responsibility of the treasurer's office. Um, mm -hmm. I think people, people have a, a, a misconception of what your job is. So here you are straight from the horse's mouth. What do you do? Yes, and, and, and this, that is such a great question. I like to start every conversation with that. And I also want to say to those that may be listening, some people feel bad when they don't know what I do. And I tell them all the time, you, you can't feel bad understanding that it was always an appointed role by the mayor. And so not necessarily did the treasurers before me have to court residents have to have that relationship with residents. Whereas me, because I am truly a representative of the people. And by the way, I always tell people, my mother taught me, you dance with the one that brought you to the party. And so the residents brought me to the party and those are the people I dance with. And so because you see me all out in the community, because you, and I know I'm gonna talk about programs that we have here. I do that because I know who I represent. And so, please don't feel bad if you don't know what I do. So a lot of people think, oh, I know Maria Pappas collects tax money. What do you do? This is absolutely different. It's so different, it's amazing. So as the city treasurer, my sole responsibility, primary, not sole, my primary responsibility is to be the personal banker for Chicago. And residents are shocked when I say that. I say, you have a personal banker. Did you know that? That's what I do. I manage the portfolio of taxpayers. And by the way, taxpayers have a portfolio now. When I took office four years ago, it was like a little over $9 billion. Now we have a portfolio of over $10 billion. And what do I do with that? I invest it to make more money for taxpayers. But as I'll talk to you about in a moment, I invest now for social impact. I want to make certain that we're investing in people. And so I use this office to do that. That's my primary role. Okay. So um, you, you, you've said the word business a few times. How, what do you do to help sustain and to help grow small businesses? Can they um, look to you for some direction in that area? Yes. So for me, my role as treasurer is twofold, where I focus on financially empowering residents and helping to promote small businesses. I believe from a financial perspective, that's very important because we have a lot of small business owners or those that aspire to be that their biggest struggle is from a financial aspect. Number one, they need access to capital. There are a lot of business owners with great ideas. They don't necessarily come from a family of means where they can go to their parents and say, I have this great idea that I need you to find. Many of us don't come from that background. And so you have these great ideas, but no access to capital. So those are things that I, as a treasurer, one of my missions is to make certain that I focus on that. And so we have programs, by the way, we have this Goldman Sachs program. And I, and I hope you all will share this with your um, networks. We have a Goldman Sachs 10,000 small businesses program where we want to help 10,000 small businesses. Oh, thank you. We have the average. You know what? Your team rocks. We, we, <laughs> we have this program. And by the way, I think that it's open now and the registration closes in June. So I'm trying to, to promote this program as much as possible. It's free. And everything I promote is free, 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 free. I, I have a woman, a young black woman, who told me she went through this program and she said she learned the difference from being a hustler 
to a small business owner, to a CEO. Whoa. And I said, wow. She said, when I started, I was just a hustler. She said, then I had to understand what it means to be a small business owner. She said, and now I have three companies and I'm a CEO. I was so in awe and so proud. And so I'm very excited about this partnership and we all know about Goldman Sachs and its reputation. And so they are looking into low to moderate income communities to help small business owners. And I'm happy to be partnering with them on that. Wow, that's that's really great information uh, for, and I hope people who are listening, you will share this information to your networks, like uh, yes. the director said. Now, I, I understand also that you're promoting home ownership, and that's that's a that's just a part of my heart, home ownership. Um, I know that there are a number of people uh, aspiring to do this. Sometimes they don't quite know how to go about it, so that they, they can really be successful. What's the treasurer's office doing to promote home ownership? Yeah, so I'll tell you personally, I mentioned to you that when I moved from Inglewood to Austin, that my mother purchased her first home. And I watched that and I'll tell you, and, and I've been to your um, meetings, clerk. I've been to how you- Property have, after death. and Property all, after death, transfer yeah. of death instrument, to this totally all those things that I've learned through the years because of my mother. And when my mother passed away two years ago, guess what? That asset that she owned mm -hmm. was now passed on to her grandchild. And so when we talk about home ownership, the reason it's so important is because I believe that home ownership is one of the quickest and easiest ways of building generational wealth. And I tell my nephews, just as I tell young people, these are assets and you make assets work for you. And so home ownership is extremely important. I know people, in addition to this, I know people that are paying $2,000 a month in rent, rent. I was meeting with someone yesterday, a very um, astute business owner. And he told me that his mother, has been renting for 40 years. Now, this is investing in someone else's property. And I thought to myself, how do we get residents to invest in themselves and have an asset that you can now pass on to generations to come and that can help build generational wealth in your family? So what do we do here in our office? So I have a program and it's called Operation Hope. And our tagline is hope inside. And what we want to do, we want to promote residents and encourage residents to really push to home ownership, but we know the struggles of it. We all know about redlining. We all know about discrimination, especially residents in low to moderate income communities. And so I really focus on those barriers. Sure, I'm going to advocate for residents with the banks and really look at the banks to try to really help residents more than what they're doing. To offer these affordable mortgages, affordable interest rates that residents need to purchase these homes. But in addition to that, I wanna take away the excuses from the banks. And so I know that I have to help residents to prepare for these mortgages. And so there's a program, I, I know you all know people that pay for credit counseling, pray, pay to clean up their credit reports. Well, through my office, we have a free program, Operation Hope, that we partner with Operation Hope and it's called Hope Inside. And with that program, we have one-on-one -on -one coaching for free for Chicago residents, where we are helping to increase their credit scores, which we know is one of the huge, the most biggest barrier for those that wanna purchase homes, especially residents in low to moderate income communities. And so please, I wanna mention my website. While you're passing along the information about Goldman Sachs, 10,000 small businesses, pass along our Hope Inside program. If you go to our website at chicagocitytreasurer.com, residents, small business owners can find out about all of this information that I'm talking about, chicagocitytreasurer.com.
Uh oh, you are mute. You are mute. There you go. Okay. You have to talk about Monday, 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 Mondays with Melissa. You've started this program back in 2020, and I've watched it several times. Please, is it going to continue? And tell our audience, what is it? And we just did a program last week. I'll tell you, it was awesome. Money Mondays with Melissa is something I began during the pandemic. And here's why. Well, when the pandemic hit, none of us knew what this was about. And, and so we, we were just really focusing on basically the physical aspect of it. How do we make it through this pandemic? And so there were just, I mean, conferences after conferences. Every day we had these press conferences, this, that, and the other. And we needed to talk about vaccination. It was just so many things going on at the time. And the focus was physical health. Well, you know, I'm always thinking about things as well from a finance perspective. And what I wanted to say, and, and I was thinking about, how do we make certain that this pandemic do not put our residents and small business owners in a hole? What we did not want is to come out the pandemic and people are in worse financial shape than they were before they began. And that's where Money Mondays with Melissa started because we were all sitting at home, we were virtual. And so I started having financial tip segments. I brought in experts from all around and we spoke about how do you survive financially through the pandemic? Well, it was such a, what you say? Oh, it was a background. Well, it was such a big hit that we went on to extend it beyond the pandemic. And so we now still do Money Mondays with Melissa. Matter of fact, last week, we had a Money Mondays with Melissa. We had Melody Span Cooper from WVON. We had Melody Hobson from Aerial Investments. And it was awesome. And Melody Hobson says something. As a matter of fact, I saw several social media posts after that about it. She says something, and it was just interesting. She said, poverty is expensive. Doesn't that seem oxymoron? Wow. But it's true. Yeah. Poverty is expensive. So we talk about all of these things on Money Mondays with Melissa. So it would definitely continue. Melody Hobson rocks, okay, yes. on so many levels. Um, she actually did a uh, workshop for us uh, several years ago. And the name of the workshop, get this, a man is not a financial plan. Think about that. Ooh, wow. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Uh, she rocked the house and we had a whole group of women and they're like, oh my goodness. But anyway, uh, I just want, I want to get in, into, um, so you've been in, in office for four years now and what, what kinds of things have you learned that are going to help you, um, you know, in your office for the future? Yes, I'll tell you, I've learned number one, that we have to bridge this gap of inequity. And we have to be more aggressive in bridging it. So talking about just home ownership, um, what we are finding is that, and I think the ratio is like of Chicago residents, like 54% of white residents are homeowners, 43% of Hispanics are homeowners. And don't quote me on these numbers. They may be just a little off, but this is in the, in the ballpark. And for Black home ownership, it's like 37% home ownership. And we are learning that there is so much disparity. We talk about disparity in education. There's disparity in home ownership. There's disparity all the way around that I use my platform to really focus on. So what I've learned is that we really have to do more in bridging that gap of inequity. And I'm really focusing a lot on how do we bring the banking institutions and its resources to the community? Because what we're finding is that many banking institutions are leaving our community. How do we yes. bring them back to our community and hold them accountable? But in addition to that, I also focus a lot on even the environment. One of the things that I did that was like um, really a huge deal nationally 
is that I made a decision, and this was a big deal for the city of Chicago because we're the third largest municipality. So when we did this, this was eye-opening, that we actually, um, as treasurer, I made a decision to divest from fossil fuel companies. So I mentioned to you earlier, as the personal banker of Chicago, I invest taxpayers' money to make more money. Well, I made a decision that, again, with the mindset and the values of the residents of Chicago, I made a decision that I was not going to invest in fossil fuel companies that hurt our environment, because we all have a role to play in fighting climate change. I have a six-year-old daughter. I think a lot about her future and the future of these young kids and how this environment is going to be for them. And so I think that we all have a part to play and fighting cl climate change and having clean energy. So that's something very important to me that I also look forward to doing more work on as I go further in my endeavors. Um, in addition to that, I talk a lot about financial literacy and I talk about how can we help residents with just learning basic things such as how to balance a checkbook, such as the best way to save money, such as let's talk about retirement and it's never too soon, no matter how young you are to talk about retirement, take advantage of when you have work at a company and they match your retirement savings. We don't get that in government. But when I was in corporate America, I took advantage of the employers matching my contribution. Those are examples that I look at and I know even with home ownership, so much more that we have to do to prepare our residents and hold banks accountable. Agreed, agreed. So I know you mentioned your website before. I want people to know where they can find this information about your office. And I'm, I'm hopeful we can uh, put your website in the chat. I thought we might have put it on one of the, um, the uh, the different, no, we didn't. Okay, so give us your um, your website again so that people can, and somebody put it in the chat for us. There it is, um, www.cityofchicagotreasure.com. And all this great information that the treasure is sharing with us, uh, you can find it on her website. Now, one, one last question I have, and then I'm going to open it up and see if we have questions from our listening audience. You know, I've been a lot of, in, in the news about the volatility of these banks and failures. And what, what is that gonna mean for the city and the city treasurer's office? Oh, I think that's a great question to close with. Now, the good news for Chicago residents is that our money is safe. And that's something that I had to make certain that I announced as soon as these, these banks started with SVP, SVB. That was a really, really big deal and very scary, to be honest with you. Um, so that is something that I want to communicate. If you know Chicago residents, if you live in Chicago, our money is safe. At the end of the day, our liquidity position is strong. That's the message. And, and by the way, all deposits that we make, we make certain that they're 100%, 100% collateralized. So that's beyond the FDIC insured. Our money is collateralized. And then many times it's secure. Collateralization just means secure. So 100% of our dollars are secured. And by the way, most of the um, banks secure our money through the Federal Home Loan Bank. So we're good to go in Chicago. Okay, that's, that's reassuring. Yes. <laughs> that's yes. really reassuring. Yes. So um, I, I'm going to jump right into the questions because I see some hands already, and we want to give our audience as many opportunities uh, to to ask any questions they may have. Absolutely. Um, Sarah has her hand up. Sarah, you want to? Yep, yeah. I have a quick question. Picking back off of what President Yarbrough was saying, how do I know as a consumer that how do I go check my bank to make sure it's it's solid. And I know you said in the city of Chicago, it's, it is, but how do we check our bank to make sure, how do we hold them accountable? What are some, is there like a couple of tips and pointers? Um, because I'd hate for my money to be lost. I hear you. <laughs> so, so number one, for an individual, you're secured up to $250,000 through the federal government. That's what FDIC insured up to $250,000 for the individual. So that's all the accounts. 
And by the okay. way, you're talking okay. about retail accounts, right? Not investment accounts. That's very different. Yes. Talking about retail accounts. Savings. Yep, checking exactly. savings. And so combined with checking and savings, you said that we're insured up to $250,000 combined with yes. both checking and savings. Okay. Yes. Now, a lot of people wonder, how do I know how great my bank is and this, that, and the other? Well, most larger banks are, I would say, you can look at the stock prices and kind of tell how things are going. But I will also tell you, to be honest with you, a lot of times there is no advance notice. And that's why FDIC insured is so important because what you get, same thing that happened at SVP, although at SVB, there were some, I would say red flags, there were. But what happened was that there are run on banks. So what happens is, as soon as one major player, like say for instance, city of Chicago, where, where we have our money. If I was to go to BMO right now, and take out, let's say a hundred million dollars. Maybe if you take out a hundred million dollars from Chase, not so much a big deal. BMO is pretty large as well, but that may be a substantial amount for the Chicago's market. And I'm using that for an example because that may not even be a big deal. But if you have a large investor that starts to pull money out, and by the way, our money is beyond FDIC, but I'm just giving an example. Then all of a sudden, people that are in tune and the word starts going around, within two, three days, everybody's running to the bank to pull out their money. Because although you have the FDIC insured, people want to get their money first. <laughs> and where I was raised, we like, as my mother would say, you going to wait on FDIC or you going to go get your money now? <laughs> So that's why you see the run on banks and that makes a bank go down quick because people are not going to wait for FDIC to, to uh, reimburse them. They're going to try to run on that bank and get that money out right away. But guess what? The bank only has so much cash in the bank. So that means people are running there to get their money out first. And that's why you hear about that. Good wow. question. What a great question. Thank you, Sarah. Are there other questions from our audience? Um, I, I just, I'm just glad that uh, Sarah asked that question because there's a lot going on today. And, oh, yes. you know, um, I've had conversations with people who are, you, you know, first of all, two, two things. One, people are talking about, you know, they, they don't feel so safe with their banks anymore. I know I've had some situations where all of a sudden money is gone out of my account and there's some name there I know nothing about. Oh, I yes. have to turn around and I have to, um, uh, you know, first of all, let them know that this happened. Then they cancel my card. That's an inconvenience. They put the money back, but then I have to wait for a card again. Oh my goodness. You know, I'm almost to the place where I take my money out and put it in the mattress. No. So, so thank you for saying that. Let me, let me, let me say something because I hear that a lot. Number one, banks, this is technology. All technology now, when we look at it is compromises. I can't tell you how many times I've had to change my Facebook password, my Instagram password, because people compromise technology all the time. So we look at our bank accounts because our money is sensitive to us. But when you really think about it, all technology is like that. Everything you have, if it's a credit card, not necessarily even just your bank account, you may have a credit card where you see unfamiliar charges. It's technology. And people say, you know, there's rumors, you know, of people from other countries tapping in. It's these group of people. I, I don't know. But the point of the matter is when it comes to technology, you do have to be mindful. You have to be up on it. I suggest to people every single morning when you wake up, I, I like to do educational things. I'm not asking you to do boring things. When you wake up in the morning, instead of looking at social media, roll over and look at your bank account. Make certain that the charges from the night before are accurate. And then also what I try to share with people, like when they say, maybe I should put my money under mattresses. Putting your money under mattresses under mattresses depreciates your money, depreciates, because you're not earning anything and the value of that money is going down. And so I tell people all the time, 
I don't care if you put your money in a low interest savings account. While I want you to put it in higher interest, I shouldn't say I don't care if, if, if you do. I want you to put it in a higher interest. But if you don't feel comfortable, at least put it in a low interest savings account because you can make some money. And some money is better than no money. Granted. Okay, so we're going to put the mattress uh, aside. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah, do you have another question? Yep. I have another question. So one, I have two. I have one. I have one statement on the security piece. Since yay, I'm in IT. Um, you, sh everyone leaves their same password all the time because it's something that they can remember and all that. You yes. should be changing your passwords so that you're not in that compromising position. And so even though it's a pain, but it's a great habit to get into, like, like a list of habits of I'm going to check my social media. Now I'm putting on my, put a sticky note next to my bed, check my bank account. <laughs> yeah. So then, Sarah, how do you remember all those passwords? That's what I want to know. <laughs> um, <laughs> because in technology, you have a place that's like, it's called a vault. And typically you can put your, you put your passwords in your vault. Um, when you store your passwords with like Google and Microsoft, there's an yes. authenticator. That authenticator is a two-step verification process. So before you can even, you can add your password there, but before you can even include your password into that password section, it goes through a two authentication verification. So okay. I, I wish I want to say that I'm a genius and I have it all in my head, but that's not true. I use an authenticator and I use a vault to say. And I do as well, Sarah, but I'm skeptical about that too. But you at least make me feel a little better because <laughs> I always, with my phone, I could go right into everything, but I always say, oh, this, all this stuff just, you know, makes you wonder sometimes, it, but anyway. It does, but an and authenticator if you lose your phone, <laughs> And if you lose no. your phone. And that's why you have a two-step verification process on your phone as well. You do not have your phone with just a password. You want a two-step verification Now, that's process. a good lunch and learn right there. It I is. We I all need to help with that. Since Sarah's in, in, in technology, I think we're going to have her to be one of our speakers to talk about those things. That's an interesting topic. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. So what was so your So here's second? my question. <laughs> here's my question. I'm always forward thinking because I'm, I'm giggling because I have a high uh, college student who is in college now. And I'm like, you said, start young, start investing when you're younger. And the college students don't get that. They don't get like, you know, what would be like maybe a couple of top tips that I can tell her about money savvy and investing her money right now from a college perspective? Oh, Sarah, that is a darn good question. Let, let me, Sarah, God bless you to have a college student, number one, because you know what? <laughs> I tell you, the amount of money that I see young, you know, and I think I'm young, but what, they, what they're doing these days, like the Uber Eats, the DoorDash, the Grub, <laughs> I'm like, you're paying how much to get food? To, like, what? You all can't just get up and go to the restaurant? That's what I did. <laughs> so, so this is not, you know, and, and you used to get food delivered, we would order pizza, but it would be a couple of dollars. Okay, but anyway, just, I mean, and then they 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 don't walk anywhere. Everything is Uber and Lyft and what happened to public transportation? So I say that to say good luck. But let me <laughs> <use this. laughs> okay, I love your honesty, so I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. So I feel for you. Let me just say you. <laughs> but what I will say is for young people, and this is something that I have learned, and I'm doing this even with my six-year-old daughter, I always tell them, all I need for you to do is just get rid of your pocket change at the end of the day. If you just start saving your pocket change at the end of the day, you'll be amazed at what that adds up to. I also like the employer, and this is one of the things that, that I really encourage parents, like the employer matching that I was talking about with retirement, I do. I would suggest parent matching with your kids. So you tell your kids, if you will save $25 a month, I'll match that. Or I may say I'll double that match. Because at the end of the day, Sarah, it's really trying to get them in the mindset of a habit. And that's one thing I've learned. Sometimes we focus on the amounts more than we focus on the habits. Okay. And so I would love to just get young people in the habit of doing things. Okay. okay. I so appreciate that. Thank you very much for answering yes. your question. Good and question. Thank, 
Yeah, and thanks for your, your question here. Do we have others that would like to engage here? I see we have 41 participants today. I know we've got some, some folks here from the clerk's office that should have some questions. Um, and, and nobody wants me to call them out, so I, I won't. <laughs> but, but I won't call them out. But um, I, I know Brian Cross has a, a, a daughter. Brian, do you, did you hear anything good that maybe you could share with Kennedy? For sure, for sure. Definitely, uh, you know, uh, Madam Treasurer, as you know, I've got a 15 year old and uh, definitely on the saving of the money end. If I, if I could, if I could conquer that, I'd be, yes. <laughs> I'd be a happy man, uh, Madam Treasurer, Madam Court. <laughs> I think okay. we all know what that's like. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. Well, any other questions? Because I know, um, Treasurer Irvin has a full schedule today, but I'm so glad <laughs> that you took out a few minutes to talk to um, our folks. We have people from the Maywood Proviso Rotary Club on with us today, as well as people from the Cook County Clerk's Office. And I appreciate all of them to joining us, but more than that, I appreciate you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Now, I, you know, we're, ha you and I are going to be uh, collaborating along with the, um, city clerk and our new secretary of state on with our blood drive so i am um thank you so much for doing this with us you'll see on your screen right now um tuesday april 25th from 10 a.m to 3 p.m over at 69 west washington on the second floor room g and h we're doing a blood drive um, Robin Staggers often says, give from your heart and donate to those in need. And so we ask that you join us. Now, I know some people cannot give blood, but those of you who can, just know that we still have a blood shortage and we need your deposits, okay? Not your money, <laughs> but your blood. <laughs> so um, please put this on your calendar. You see there's a QR code that you can just scan in. We do have to make appointments for people. And Madam Treasurer, I just so appreciate you collaborating with us on this endeavor. Uh, we, we've done it a few years now and we've gotten great support. So I'm looking forward to you and Anna Valencia and Alexi yes. Dionulis supporting um, our efforts here so we can help somebody else. So yes. do you have any parting words for us, Treasure Irvin? You know, I'll just say, um, it's no secret that I am a fan of yours, Madam Clark, I'll tell you. Um, but the more and more that I learn about the things that you do from your office, things that you don't necessarily have to do, but it's your passion and you choose to do it. Like when I went to the session you had about um, proceeds after death and what to do with the transfer of home ownership after death, and you spoke about preparation, and I thought about that and, and how I focus myself on the financial aspect of things and I and we talk a lot about the same things it, it just it's it's so wonderful and refreshing to hear elected officials going beyond the walls of their offices to actually help people and I think about the the blood drive this is awesome especially for residents and low to moderate income communities. This is so very important. And also I know Robin made a note about this um, program that I'm also partnering with you this year. And that is the Love Purse Initiative in October. Yes. Oh my goodness, wait till you see that. And that we're inviting all of our employees to participate. I, I believe we had over 200 purses to wow. give to women who are victims of domestic violence. Um, you know, that's a whole, it's, it's, yes. it's in every community. Yes. Um, there's no, no um, big eyes and little U's and yes. it's not happening just in those communities of need. This happens across the board. And so um, we work with uh, Maria Castro from Comcast and uh, it's a, fantastic program she's uh, I think she's given away her 20 I think it's 25,000 purses so far and we want to wow. help with that effort so I'm I'm excited about that that's in October and I think that's domestic violence awareness month so yes, thank you for, for working with us on that and we'll be um 
partnering to, to help somebody else. And I, and by know, the I, way, I, great job by your team. Like they had everything, everything I was talking about was on the screen. And, and I tell you, this is, this has just been great. I love sessions like this. I'm glad for those that join, spread the word. Again, ChicagoCityTreasurer.com. If you just go to the website, you'll hear this and more. And by the way, in September, we're going to do a huge, oh my gosh, this takes so much work for us, this huge symposium we do, Building Wealth Today for Tomorrow. You know, I'm all about building generational wealth. And so thank you, Madam Clerk, for having me today. I'm so glad that you do this. This is awesome. This is why I was interested in joining Maywood Rotary. I had already heard about things that you all were doing, but this is just absolutely awesome. I'm excited about it. I'm excited to join in and listen in on the future Lunch and Learns. And I just really thank everyone for joining us today. Let's give it up for our Chicago City treasure. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our lunch and learn for today. Thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you in the very near future. Bye. Bye bye.